Not for a moment will God forsake us or ever leave us. It's one thing to sing that. It's another thing to really believe that and to be reminded of it and trust that. So let's pray and ask God to be with us in this moment as we come to his word. Father God, we thank you that the words we sing are true. You're faithful. You're good. And not for a moment have you ever forgotten about us or left us, even when we forget and leave you. So God, we pray in this moment you'll speak to us through your word because we really need to hear from you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, as you saw, we're beginning a brand new series, a sermon series throughout the summer. I'm excited about it. The series is called Did God Say That? Where we say things or um, use words or phrases that either God did not say or maybe he did say, but we twist them out of shape. And I, I can't uh, say this without thinking about the great movie, uh, The Princess Bride, one of the all-time fa- most fantastic movies ever made. If you haven't seen it, that should be on your quarantine to-do list as a family. And of course, there's the scene where Vicini, the villain, uh, keeps saying the word inconceivable. And then Inigo Montoya says to him, that key word, that word, you keep using that word. I do not think that word means what you think it means. And that's a a little bit of what this series is about. We say things that maybe don't mean what we think they mean. And we're going to tackle one slogan or phrase that I hear frequently, maybe you have heard or even used. It's the phrase, does everything happen for a reason? Uh, Is that true? Does everything really happen for a reason? Uh, a number of years ago, I was uh, on my way out of the office at our South Street campus uh, uh, running to an appointment, and as I walked out, I saw a couple sitting in the lobby waiting to get some help at our Shepherd's Heart Care Center. And I went out to my car and realized oh, I forgot my keys. So I went back in, passed by the same couple, back to my office, got my keys, and headed back out again. And this time, I'm passing by them now for the third time. Something made me stop and talk to them for a minute. I mean, I was already late for my appointment, so why not? I stopped and asked them their names, told them who I was. We shared a little bit that he was recently out of work, was just laid off, and they were in some trouble financially, and they had come for help. They weren't part of our church family, but they heard that we're a church who might help them. And so we talked, and and even I spent a moment to pray for them. And I was praying that God would provide for him a job. As I'm praying, I could hear his cell phone buzzing in his own pocket. And so I finished the prayer up quickly, figured because he needed to answer the phone. He pulled his phone out of his pocket, and it was his old boss calling to give him his job back. He looked at me with huge eyes, and his wife said, well, I believe everything happens for a reason. We came here for a reason. Now, in that moment, what she said made perfect sense, because everything about that encounter with this couple felt like it was divinely ordained. But is it true that everything always happens for a reason. And if it's true, is it a reason we can always know or understand? And how would we know or understand what that reason is for everything that happens? I most often hear people using this phrase to try and offer some comfort to people in the midst of tragedy or when terrible things happen, to explain why something bad happened. Yes, you don't understand it now, but everything happens for a reason. And what we mean by that sometimes is God has a plan, and this is part of God's plan. And you don't see it now, but someday you will. The curtain will be pulled back, and you'll get it in a way that you don't. You just don't have God's perspective yet, but someday you will have his perspective, and he'll show you why this happened. Sometimes the phrase, everything happens for a reason, gives us comfort. But sometimes it makes us cringe because I've been on the receiving end of it, maybe you have as well, when someone says that to you and you're in despair. You're facing something really dark. And you feel like I should be comforted, but you wonder, well, what's the reason for this? I can't make sense of it. Imagine, uh, for example, even on the lighter note, uh, husbands for a minute saying to your wife, when you forget your anniversary and you do nothing and she brings it up to you and you say, well, honey, everything happens for a reason. You see, you just don't see why I forgot our anniversary yet, but the God has a plan for this and there's a reason and we just have to trust him and we'll find out. Maybe the reason is because you're an idiot and you forgot. Sometimes things just happen because of choices we make. Sometimes things happen to us and we didn't choose them. On a more serious level, does the coronavirus happen for a reason? What's the reason? Was the killing of Ahmaud Aubrey or George Floyd, did that happen for a reason? What's the reason? The further you dig, you realize there's some issues with this that we need to wrestle through. On the surface, it sounds good. 
But how do we understand it as Christ followers? It doesn't take long before you realize it's a very complex issue. And on one hand, we want there to be a reason because it's scary to think that we might live in a world where there are no reasons. There's nothing behind it all. There's no reason for your existence or mine. And there's no grand plan behind it all. That's an, a very unsettling thought. But it's equally unsettling to think that there's an actual specific reason for every occurrence that happens because some of them seem so random and so terrible. One of the mistakes I think that we make when we're thinking about this issue is that we assume that it's an either-or question. Either everything happens always for a direct reason, or there's no reason for anything at all. The Bible, as is always the case, is much more nuanced than this. It gives us a more balanced view and, and a better resources, better wisdom for how to think about this issue in our lives. There's a story in John chapter 9 when the disciples come across a man who's been born blind. Remember that, born blind. And they look at the man and they turn to Jesus and they say, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that this happened to him? Now think about that for a minute. He was born blind. And their only explanation is either he sinned, when? In the womb? Or his parents sinned, but it's either this or that. Those are the only two possibilities they could come up with. And what does Jesus say? He says, it's not either or, it's neither. Neither one of them sinned. He said, that's not the reason this happened. It happened so that God's glory could be put on display. Because then Jesus makes spits and makes mud and heals the man miraculously. Jesus doesn't say, here's the reason. He says, it just happened, but God is going to show you something in it. So, what does the Bible actually have to say about this question? Does everything happen for a reason? Well, quite a lot, actually. We're going to turn it to a couple of places, uh, a couple of texts that illustrate sort of the, the scope and range of what the Bible teaches on this question. First is in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And the Apostle Paul says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So this is one of the central texts that people use to defend this idea that everything happens for a reason. He says that all things happen, uh, that happen to us, God can work together for good according to his purpose. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, we read, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Once again, God's purpose and plan is working all things even if he's not causing them. Or Psalm 135, verse 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth and in the seas and all the deeps. God does what God wants at all times. So with other verses, Psalm 33, verse 11, tells us God's plans stand forever. And so Proverbs 19, 21 tells us the purpose of the Lord stands forever. We're talking about what theologians call the sovereignty of God. I'll just, the circles are har the hardest thing to draw, but I'll give it my best. If I'm drawing a circle that dem demonstrates the sovereignty of God, it better be a decent circle, huh? Anyway, the sovereignty of God. Meaning, if this is the sovereignty of God, in everything that happens, in, that happens in the world happens inside of this circle. By the way, the word sovereignty is a compound word. It means the super reign, the super reign of God. So this circle is the sovereignty of God. All that exists, all that happens in the universe, all that takes place happens inside of God's sovereignty. Sovereignty. <laughs> Nothing happens outside of God's sovereignty. The Bible affirms this from beginning to end. All that happens happens inside of God's sovereignty. So whatever we're talking about, we have to talk about in that context. The, the, God's sovereignty, the absolutely everything is inside of his knowledge and his control. Nothing happens that God goes, how did they get in there? How did that, who let that happen? Nothing surprises God. Nothing catches God off guard. Nothing is outside of God's knowledge or ultimate will and sovereign control. He's in control of everything that happens. This is how the God of the Bible is revealed to us. He has no limits. But there's a problem with this. There's a problem if you stop and think about it. Taking at face value the idea that God is sovereign and he has a plan for us all and that his plan is good and that everything happens for a reason, well, that's true as far as it goes. 
As Christians, we believe, I believe, that the Bible teaches that there is order to the universe. God created it and ordered it. That my life has a purpose and a design and a plan, and so does yours. And that God is in sovereign control, and that he is working these things out. But in the big picture, playing the long game, this is absolutely true. There is reason and meaning to our existence. However, I don't think this is what people always mean when they say everything happens for a reason. What's often implied or subconsciously understood is that this particular thing that's happening is specifically willed by God to happen. The sense that everything that has ever happened or will ever happen is the direct result of God wanting it to happen. That's often what's either implied or understood when people use the phrase, everything happens for a reason. We can't understand the reason because we don't see the whole picture yet. We don't see all of it, but God does. If this is what we mean when we say everything happens for a reason, then we have a bit of a theological mess on our hands for at least two reasons. The first reason is what theologians and philosophers have called the problem of evil. Uh, and I'll refer you back if you'd like to hear a whole sermon on the problem of evil. It goes like this. Why, if God is sovereign and perfect and knows all things and can do all things, would he allow evil and suffering to exist? Either he's not sovereign and good and he can't stop it, or he allows it and therefore he's not good. That's the big conundrum, the big question. We preached a whole sermon on this in our Explore God series a couple of years ago. I would encourage you to go back and listen to that if you'd like to hear more about it. But in brief, there's not only what you'd call natural evil in the world, disease and disaster, the coronavirus, for example. Is that just the way viruses mutate and it just happened in a broken world? Romans chapter 8 tells us that all corruption is subjected to futility and decay because of sin. So inside of God's sovereignty, we have other operating circles. One is the natural world. And the natural world is corrupted by sin. There are good and wonderful and beautiful things that happen in the natural world. There are also some things that happen in the natural world that aren't so good and aren't so wonderful and that are awful. And we also have operating inside of God's sovereignty the second part of the problem, which is what theologians call free will. Human freedom and responsibility. That we actually have choices and our choices actually matter. This is a part of the problem. This is the moral evil question. So there are bad things that happen as a result of the natural world. There are bad things that happen because they're, it's morally evil. People do terrible things to each other. We're watching that play out across our nation before our very eyes. So if we're saying that God wills everything to happen, then we're saying that God wills some things to happen that are against his will. You see, it's a logical fallacy, and it's a problem in how we understand God. God cannot and does not will evil because he's light, and in him there's no darkness at all, the Scripture tells us. He's perfect, pure, holy, and good. Inside of his sovereign will, he allows certain things to happen while not willing them or causing them. The second reason for the theological mess is, is what we call free will. If everything is directly the result of God's will, he causes it, then there's no room for our will. If it's 100% God, it can't be any you or me, and therefore we're not really free. Your choices really aren't your choices. You're predetermined to make them, and you don't have any choice in the matter or control, and therefore you're really not a free being. You're much more of like a, a robot, an automaton. You're, you're pre-conditioned, -hard hardwired, to do all the things that you do, say all the things that you say, think all the things that you think, and therefore not human, more like a puppet. And if we're predetermined extensions of God's will, then there really is no such thing as God loving us or us loving God. It's because, you see, free will is kind of important when it comes to love. We all understand this. If, if a man falls in love with a woman and she doesn't return that, 
and he seeks to force her, we would say, whatever that is, it isn't love because you can't force it. It must be freely returned because free will is important. From the beginning, the Bible asserts that you were created in God's image. You were created to be in relationship with him and you are created with the capacity to respond, the relative freedom to respond to him. So inside of God's sovereignty, there's got to be room for our freedom. And the Bible asserts this in numerous places. We're told in Genesis, or it's Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. This is what we might call the law, the principle of reaping and sowing. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. He means there's the principle of the consequences of your actions. You will reap what you sow. You have choices to make, and they do have consequences here and now and in eternity. The Scripture teaches us. In addition to our free will, people don't just operate in isolation from each other. We don't just live in our own little self-contained bubble making our own decisions. We interact in society and in culture. We set up governments and systems and institutions, and those also have a collective impact on society. So we might say that there's another operating system here inside of God's sovereignty, and that is uh, society. Or the systems that we set up. When we talk about systemic racism, systemic evil, systemic injustice, we mean, we, don't, we mean that sometimes because of the corruption of sin in our own hearts, when we get together and try to set up systems, those systems produce a result that is not good. And that too is operating inside of God's sovereignty. Sometimes those systems are producing wonderful things, but they're not perfect. And then lastly, there's another operating system at work. I can tell already I've drawn these circles out of perspective, but that's because I'm a flawed human being. And this system is what we would call the forces of of darkness or evil. Meaning, The book of Ephesians says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, principalities, and forces of this dark world, meaning there's real evil. Now, those forces are not equal to God. They exist inside of God's sovereignty. He reigns over them and allows them for a time, but they're still operating. So let's just think about this little model, and and it's not perfect, but sometimes we look out at the world and we see a white police officer kill a black man in an unjustified manner. Where does that fit? Well, it's a result of sinful human free will influenced by societal systems and the forces of evil. It fits somewhere in here. Sometimes we look out the world and we see a pandemic, a virus that's wreaking havoc and people responding to it in all kinds of ways full of fear and anxiety, crushing economies, taking lives. Where does that fit? Part of the natural world? sometimes influenced by human free will. These systems interact and interplay, all happening inside of God's sovereignty. So I hope you're seeing it's far more complex. Does everything happen for a reason? Everything has a reason, but it doesn't mean that God is causing everything to happen for a specific reason. But we're not done quite yet. From the beginning, God teaches that he created us in his image to be in relationship with him and to respond to his love. Additionally, the Bible teaches that our choices have consequences. So we need an understanding of God's sovereignty that encompasses all of these things. And this brings us to the purpose. We've talked about the problem. Let's talk about the purpose. Romans 8.28 does say uh, that, that all things work together for good. It does not say all things are good. We have to hold two things in tension in our theology here. And by the way, we almost always have to do this. We have to hold in tension two things in our minds and our hearts that are hard to reconcile. On the one hand, we have to say some things are evil and they break God's heart and God says they're not good and we should say the same thing God says about them inside of his sovereign will. And yet, 
God can and will ultimately work those things for his good purposes in the lives of those who love him. Sometimes he does this in the short term when we can see it. Sometimes we actually get to see the reason why God allowed this and something good come from it. But I think for most situations, we don't get to see that. And so we hold on to the fact that ultimately speaking, he will work all things together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I think the best example of this comes to us in the Old Testament, outside the cross itself, comes to us in the Old Testament uh, story of Joseph. Now, the story of Joseph is fascinating. I, I love the story of Joseph. If you read through Genesis, chapters 1, 2, and 3 are the story of how everything got created. Now, think about this. Everything that exists the creation of the entire universe and the fall, how it all went wrong in three chapters. And we get 14 chapters on the story of one guy's family, the story of Jacob and Joseph's, Jacob's and his sons, Joseph and, and his brothers. Why would God just tell us the story of everything that exists in three chapters and then take all these long chapters to tell us this one story? Because I think in that story, we see our story. It's a story of how sin and suffering and dysfunction are wrapped up in the sovereignty and the salvation of God. And if you don't know the story, Joseph is the youngest of, 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 of his 11 brothers, and he's daddy's favorite. I mean, this is a seriously dysfunctional family. Every family from the beginning, starting with Adam and Eve, was dysfunctional, yours and mine included, but this is like the archetypal dysfunctional family. Jacob, who himself was the least favored son of his bro he and his brother Esau by his father Isaac, favors Joseph, and he spoils him, and, he, and his brothers resent him deeply for it. He puts on the coat of many colors, which when I think about the coat of many colors, I think about WWE robes in like the 80s when wrestlers would come into the ring wearing their sparkly, shiny robes, walking in. I think of Joseph wearing this robe, and it's just a, it's just a thorn in his brother's side. They see this robe, and they know that daddy gave it to him, and it's like just in their face that, he, that dad loves him more. The brothers are out tending the fields one day, and J Jacob sends his son Joseph, the youngest, to check on his brothers. He's not even working as hard as they are. So he puts on his fancy robe, right? And he goes out to find them. And he finds them, and they see him coming. And as he approaches, they plot to kill him. This is how bad it's gotten. Human free will, forces of evil, right? Let's get rid of this guy. Reuben says, talks them out of it. One of their brothers says, don't, don't kill him. Throw him in this pit, but don't kill him. So they throw him in a pit, and then they, just, they get to talk, and they say, "Why we could make some money off this. They sell him. They sell their brother as a slave to a caravan coming by for, for silver, and they dip his fancy robe in the blood of an animal, and they lie to their old aging father about it and fake his death. Years go by. Joseph is sold as a slave into the home of an Egyptian official. He rises to power through some amazing circumstances. He becomes the number two guy in Egypt, and there's a huge famine in the land. Now, generation, years have gone by, decades have gone by, and his family, his brothers, and their descendants are starving, and they come to Egypt having no idea what happened to Joseph, thinking he's probably long dead, to buy grain because they're dying, they're starving. And guess who they meet? Joseph, their brother. And it's a fascinating story, but at the end of the story, the very end of the story, when the brothers are trembling because they think Joseph is going to do what any normal person would do, an exact revenge. Genesis 50, verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. As for you, you meant it for evil. Let's not be, let's be clear about this. It's bad to sell your brother into slavery. That God did not will that. God did not make that happen. God did not desire that. That breaks God's heart. It's not good. If you're confused about this, don't sell your siblings into slavery. That's evil, right? Yet, inside of God's sovereignty, he could work it for his good. He could use what was evil and wrong to do something miraculous and remarkable and save many. I, would, I think sovereignty is always best read backwards. We get into trouble when we try to look at the sovereignty of God and project forward and say, ah, this is why this is happening. I see why this is happening. 
I don't think we're capable because we're finite. We don't have God's mind. I'm not God, and neither are you. I read recently that Anne Lamott in one of her books said, the difference between God and me is that God never thinks he's me. (laughs) I love that. God never confuses the fact that he, but we often think we're God. We're not. I can't look into the future. I can't understand going forward all of God's sovereign will, but I can look back. I can look back and I can see what God has done and I can trust what he will do. And this brings us to what I would call the promise. The promise of what God has done and will do. Because sometimes the sovereignty of God, he actually enters in. Sometimes in God's sovereignty, he doesn't just stand far off at a distance. It's not like God made the universe, wound it up, and set it loose, and okay, these systems are all working like gears, and he's just watching and saying, well, you know, we'll see how it works out. Sometimes God directly enters in. We see that in Scripture. We feel that in our lives. And the central truth of the gospel is that, in fact, he has. That he cares so much that he would enter in to the very brokenness, to the center, the intersection of the spiritual forces of darkness, of the evil in our own hearts and our own moral choices, of the brokenness of the natural world and the systems that we set up. And he would subject himself to it, which would lead him to the cross where he would die, be rejected, betrayed, tortured, suffer the consequences of all of it. And yet somehow those things, which were evil, God would turn for good. God would use as the instrument of, of redemption of all things and the salvation of those who will trust him. Joseph, in, in chapter 50, verse 20, is looking backward, saying, God, you meant it for evil, and it was evil, but God meant it for good. We can do the same thing. We can do the same thing. We can look at God's sovereignty and look back to the cross and say, what people intended for evil, the unjust death of the Son of God, God was doing something, something beautiful in the midst of it. This is the promise. The fact that God allows things to happen does not mean that he stands distant or that he's disinterested in what is happening. The story of the gospel tells us the opposite. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 tells us, He, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, He, Jesus, is the image and the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by a word of his power. So Jesus, the one who holds all things together, he's holding it all in his sovereign control. That same one is the one who enters in to the center of the mess we've made to save it, to redeem us and it. So I don't know the reason for the coronavirus. I don't know. I see some good things happening in my own family and our church life. I see some not so good things. You do as well. I don't know all of the reasons specific for the racial injustice and oppression and hatred and violence we see in our country. So I don't know that I would want to say everything happens for a reason in that sense. But let me give you, as we close, three things that you can say which are far, far better than the trite everything happens for a reason. First, everything exists inside of God's sovereign knowledge and will. I need that to be true, and so do you. Nothing exists outside of his sovereign knowledge or will. Nothing surprises God. Nothing catches God off guard. Nothing else is outside of his control. My life, your life, and all lives exist inside of the sovereign knowledge and will of God. Second, everything can be used by God for his good purposes in my life. Everything, even the darkest, most awful thing, can be used by God for his good purposes in my life. And third, everything will ultimately be redeemed by God. So does everything happen for a reason? Well, it depends on what you mean by that. But everything happens inside his sovereign control. Everything can be used by him to work good in your life, and everything will ultimately one day be redeemed by God. Let's pray and praise him for those remarkable truths. Father, when we talk about reasons, it's far beyond us. And we get twisted up in our minds because we're so small in our thinking. So we thank you that your word is is not simple, it's nuanced. 
It's balanced and it's so wise. And you show us that inside of your sovereign control, our puny lives exist. And that you care deeply about what happens to us. And that you're at work even while awful things happen. You're working all things together for your good, bringing about the redemption of all creation and your good purpose in those who trust you. So right now, God, I just pray for those who are watching right now who, who have not placed their trust in you, that in this moment they would come to see that their life too is inside of your sovereign control and that you're working things in their lives to draw them closer to you. Even the pain and the tragedy, God, you're using to draw their hearts into relationship with you. That pray right now, God, that in this moment they would surrender to you, recognizing that their life isn't random, that all along you made them in your image to be in relationship with you. You love them dearly and you died for them. We thank you for this amazing truth, God. We rest in it. We cling to it. We pray in your name. Amen.